Hello everybody, this is Chris Christodoulou and you're listening to the Risk of Rain 2 album commentary. If you're not familiar with my previous album commentaries, what's going to happen is, is I'm going to play the album in its entirety and talk about my compositional approach, the development of the game in relation to the music, Easter eggs, anything really, anything that uh, is related to this album and the past three years that I've been working on it. So, let's get to it. So this is the first track, it's called Through a Cloud Darkly, and here comes the main theme. I was very excited to write this track, which is ironically the very last thing that I got to compose and produce for the game. And the reason is that I got to bring back the Risk of Rain motive in its original sound, as heard in the opening track of the first Risk of Rain game. This track plays during the opening cutscene of the game and its uh, goal is to kind of set the mood of this mysterious planet that our uh, characters are about to land on and explore. If you pay attention to the long droney notes that make up this track, you will realize that they are actually the Risk of Rain motive. Just like in the first game, so in this one I tried to utilize this small motive as much as possible. So it's used for occasions like this one, where they make up the atmosphere. They are used in like guitar riffs, they are sneaked in melodies and solos, all kinds of places and, and in all kinds of uh, forms. Sometimes I go downwards, upwards, I reverse it, I mirror it, and in general I'll just try to use it as much as possible. And now we're going into the titular track. This is actually one of the very first things I wrote for the game, in the form of a very, very crude demo, which consisted of literally a drum loop and uh, this arpeggiated uh, synth that will come in in a moment. That's the one. So if I remember correctly, I wrote three or four demos. One of them was the track that eventually became Parjanya, and the other one is the track that's now called Nocturnal Emission. But what's specifically important about the demo that became this track is that this is the first full-fledged track that I got to write for the game. And for this exact reason, it carries a lot of weight. Because at that point, it's not just about writing a decent piece of music that you know just sounds good. It's about defining the very sound of the entire soundtrack and figuring out how this game will sound like. Uh, in other words, developing my first canvas, my template, for the rest of the music. Usually when I start a new project, this is an exciting moment, finding this canvas and getting to your sound. It's a hard thing to do, but it's also exciting because a lot of possibilities ahead of you. There's no one single solution to a problem. Maybe this music fits the game, but doesn't mean that a purely orchestral soundtrack, for example, wouldn't also be a good fit. But working on a sequel makes things a bit tougher because you now have to, you know, kind of connect the dots from the one game to the other. So it was not just about coming out with a brand new sound from scratch, but it was about taking the old sound and developing it into something that felt both new but also familiar. To do that, an obvious way was to bring back some of the original sounds of the game. This Mellotron-like sound that we just listened to is one of them. It's a sound that was used extensively in the first game, so I brought it back because I also liked it a lot. But then again, I didn't want it to be kind of a rehash of new sounds, so 
to put them in new context, I needed to, you know, surround them with new stuff. And one of the things that was implied a lot in the first soundtrack, but was not really there that much, was the electric guitar. So I thought, let's try having more guitars on this one. So here comes a guitar. And if you pay attention, the end of the phrase is none other than the Risk of Rain motive, of course. So let me talk about a pivotal moment about the production of this track in particular, but also the entire soundtrack, which is the introduction of the acoustic drum kit that will come in a minute. For the longest time, I thought I can do this soundtrack using only electronic drums. But as much as I tried, the climax of the piece just wouldn't work. I tried layering more sounds, adding impacts with other ways, but it just wouldn't get to the point that I felt like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. But when I finally decided, okay, let's try the acoustic drums and let's actually try them in a way that is a bit more naturalistic than the one used in the original soundtrack, then it really unlocked for me. And that was the moment when I felt, okay, now I know the sound that I'm going for. I think this is a good time to talk about the very first discussions that Hope and I had about the game and the music. So I got an email from Hope that essentially went like this. Chris, you knew that we're going to do Risk of Rain 2 sooner or later. The time has come and we're doing it in 3D. Now, this was a very exciting email to get because the first thing that it communicated to me is that we will not rest on our laurels, we will not repeat the same thing again, and we invite you into this crazy journey with us, into literally terra incognita. We don't know what's going to happen. Quite literally, where we're going, there'll be monsters. So we eventually jumped on a call with Hopu and discussed the music in a little bit more detail. And one of the very first things we talked about was how are we going to convey this vastness, this open space that we can actually experience now in 3D. Because in the 2D world of the first game, the space is implied, but now you can actually roam through it and you know discover it and experience its up and downs, its hills and mountains, have enemies attacking you from all over the place. Bottom line was that this openness needed to be expressed through music. So this led us to two decisions. One was regarding length. As you know, if you have played the game or listened to the soundtrack enough, the level tracks are long. They are, almost all of them are above the five minute mark, if I'm not mistaken, and some go up to like 12 minutes. This way we would accommodate players that just wanted to take their time with their levels and discover like every nook and cranny or just play slowly and enjoy the vastness. The other thing is that we wanted the music to be more atmospheric and more moody and instead of having this constant drive that was more prominent in the original soundtrack, this time around would be more kind of like the music of the place and not of the events that are happening. Of course, all the pieces of music eventually go into a more driven mode, a more upbeat mode, more pushing, but they all also include a lot of ambience, slower parts, like the one we're listening to now, in this piece called Evapotranspiration. So let's talk a little bit about this piece. One interesting thing about it is that it actually has a particular musical element, the acoustic uh, percussion, which were essentially 
actively discarded from the rest of the soundtrack. The story behind the use of the percussion in this piece was that while we were working on it, we were discussing about ways to have the music be a bit more dynamic, a bit more reactive to what's going on. And the approach that we decided on was to include a couple of layers of music that would essentially fade in and out, depending on the amount of action. And uh, an obvious layer to experiment with this was the percussion. Eventually, we kind of discarded this idea. The result of this was that I didn't really need this kind of acoustic percussion sound, so I didn't really reuse it in the rest of the soundtrack. So this is an important moment for the entire soundtrack because a very crucial idea that is used throughout the album originates from this uh, section. Pay attention to the high-pitched clicking sound. You see that we have five clicks against the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four of the regular beat. This is called a polypulse or a cross rhythm. It's a kind of polyrhythmic concept of having two clashing metric units playing against each other. In this case, it's a five against four. And the unit that is counting five during a specific uh, length of time is called a quintuplet. Usually when we say quintuplet, we mean five where we would normally have four, but we can actually use quintuplets in all sorts of ways, for example, five instead of two, five instead of six, etc. The point is that the concept of the quintuplet appears throughout the soundtrack, so I'm gonna try to uh, point it out when it comes back and discuss how it has informed the actual writing of the music on occasion. So, was anyone counting? We were talking about fives. This is an example of a piece of music that is written with a bass five instead of four, that is the usual case. Depending on your analysis approach, you might uh, say that this is a piece that is actually in four four but instead of having four subdivisions in each beat, we have five. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And each of those beats has five subdivisions. Or you can simply say that it is a, a piece written in 5.8 or 5.16, if you feel that it's too fast. Or you can call it a piece written in 20.16 or 28, if you want. We just listened to xylophone, which is a sound that uh, is also from the original soundtrack. Very prominently used in uh, surface tension. And another sound you can hear in the background here is the sound of the acoustic guitar, which is a brand new element that was not used at all in the original soundtrack, but uh, makes a couple of appearances in this one. Another sound from the original soundtrack, this chip tuny arpeggio that is in the background right now. This piece, which is called Thermodynamic Equilibrium, is basically an homage to Jean Michel Jarre. Particularly in its use of transposing a, an entire musical idea complete with like harmonies and melodies and stuff 
from the tonic from the one to the five. And instead of having the five be a major, like a dominant, uh, we just transpose it completely. So it's from a minor one to a minor five. And here's the acoustic guitar again. On the sides, if you're listening with headphones or like decent speakers. So in this part of the piece, a complex metric modulation is taking place, a kind of metric transposition, if you will. I'll try to explain it as best as possible, but if you don't get it, don't worry, it's perfectly normal. Ask me in the comments, and I'll try to elaborate. So when before we had four beats and each beat had five metric units in it, now we have five beats and each of them has four metric units. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, two, four, four, three, four, three, four, 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 five, four, three, four. For those of you who didn't get that, which is perfectly understandable, what I did is try to count one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four. I mean, let me see you do it better if you can. And now we're back to normal, which is. One two three four five. 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 Two three four. One two three four. Etc. Etc. I should note that the lead melody here is played by a CS80 synthesizer. Well, actually, a virtual emulation of a CS80 synthesizer, which is a synth created by Yamaha in the late 70s. It's a synth that can produce a very characteristic sound with very rich harmonics that was famously used by Evangelis for the Blade Runner soundtrack. This is not the first time that we hear the soundtrack, but it's one of the times that is used as a featured instrument and plays the lead melody. Uh, a lot of the other times is in the background doing pads and stuff. There are other cases where it's uh, more up front, and I'll, I'll try to mention them as we go along. And now we're going into terra pluvium, which is Latin for uh, land of rain. When I was writing this track, I was kind of going for a spiritual uh, sequel to Moisture Deficit from the original soundtrack. That's why if you notice like the harmony that's going on has this uh, semitone um, chromatic movement upwards. Etc. Etc. Which is kind of the movement that I was using in Terra Pluvium in the guitar part, in the opening. In fact, for this exact reason, to kind of like connect the dots here, I took the guitar part and created this pad that you're listening to in the background, which goes kind of with this tremolo effect. I'll uh, note it later when it's uh, soloed again. This is one of the few tracks that I'm using a virtual bass. I'm not, I don't mean an electronic bass, like a synth bass. I mean, I'm using the sound of an electric bass, but it's played with a virtual instrument using Trillion from Spectrasonics because I wanted this really clean, uh, rich in harmonics bass sound, this don. And uh, the, the bass that I have here doesn't really produce the sound. It's kind of an old crappy Harley Benton five string bass with uh, old strings. And uh, well, it has, a, let's say, some limitations to the sounds it can produce. I love using it because I love playing it, and it is nice to, you know, come up with bass lines in the actual instrument, but uh, sometimes you just need the sound, and this was one of those times. Again, the, the Risk of Rain motive, uh, of course, here. Mm -hmm. 
This is a track which makes use of uh, my Eurorack. Eurorack is a modular format, which means that you are creating a hardware synthesizer, but you're uh, uh, picking up specific modules. So you're instead of having like a fixed uh, path of audio synthesizer, like buying a stock synthesizer, you can you can kind of create one of your own, so you can choose you know, your uh, sound generator, your filter, your uh, LFOs, what have you, and uh, connect them using uh, cables and kind of create your own patches. And this is um, kind of a first for me because I've been, I mean, I've used synthesizers in the past when I was young and playing with bands and stuff, but uh, it, it was a very long time since I had actually recorded a physical synth, and let alone one that I built myself, essentially. I kind of started this uh, project of building my own Eurorack a, a couple of years ago, just because I was like, I think it's time to like look into hardware stuff. I've been using VSTs for so long, and I love VSTs, don't get me wrong, they are the best, because you can have a synth like CS80 or a Moog Modular or whatever, which are prohibitively expensive or just don't exist anymore. But sometimes it's nice to, you know, put your hands on something and twist it and patch cables and do stuff like that. Every, every tool and every, every different plugin, every different uh, way of working is, a, is often a boost for creativity because it puts you in, in a different state of mind. And I often say that it's not about the tools. You, people shouldn't obsess, you know, which is the best compressor, which is the best EQ, you know, things like that. They're, they're very boring debates. Uh, but uh, a good tool can often be inspiring. Anyway, we just listened to a guitar solo, but thankfully there's another one coming, so, you know. So for example, this uh, arpeggiated in the background, this little arpeggiated synth in the background is made using the Eurorack and some other weird sounds that we'll occasionally get to listen to. I'll, I'll try to, you know, point them out. And think about the quintuplets again. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Now there comes a little part where I took the drums, a drum fill, and reversed it to... Just built in, in for the solo moment. As I said, there are plenty of guitars in the soundtrack. And uh, this is a kind of a um, typical example of how I like using the guitar. There's a lot of distortion, there's a wah-wah pedal, there's a lot of uh, tremolo, like the whammy bar. And on top of the guitar, there's the, the classic uh, Risk of Rain synth, like doing another line. I'm gonna talk about this concept of like uh, layering of solos a bit later, actually, in the, in the at the end of the soundtrack. But now I wanna focus on the part that's coming right up right now, which is a part that seemingly comes out of nowhere. And this is an homage to Michael Land's music for uh, the, a LucasArts video game called The Dig. It's a sci-fi adventure and it's a soundtrack that is very influential to me and I always wanted to do something with it and I thought, okay, we are doing a sci-fi game, we're in space, it uh, might be a nice opportunity to try something and I essentially I copied it's the opening track, it's called Mission to the Asteroid, the chords are exactly the same, they're just reorchestrated using the sounds of uh, Risk of Rain. 
and it had the exact effect I was uh, going for, which is to kind of abruptly finish the track with a sense of wonder. And now we're listening to Copen as Fuck. The piece is written in 7 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Which is a time signature I really like and I use often. But I think what's more interesting about it is that it's actually composed in uh, the Locrian mode. Or at least as much as a piece can be composed in the Locrian mode without cheating. If you're not sure what a mode is, think of it like a variation of the major or minor scale. If you are familiar with the piano, think of the white keys. If you start from C and end on C, that's the Ionian mode. Then we have the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian, the Mixolydian, the Aeolian, and then we have the Locrian. Locrian is the mode that starts from a B and ends with a B. What's curious about the Locrian mode, and what's unique about it, is that its fifth is uh, a diminished fifth. Which means that from B to F, we have a diminished fifth. Every other uh, mode features a proper uh, fifth, uh, like a perfect fifth, we call it. To put it otherwise, the, the distance from C to G, which is a perfect fifth in the Ionian mode, is the same as the distance to D to A in the Dorian mode, etc., etc., except the Locrian mode, which the distance from B to F is a diminished fifth. And that is a very fundamental uh, interval, and especially in Western music. And a lot of uh, the music that we listen to kind of is based on that interval. So having that being disrupted and being diminished really kind of breaks the mold of how we write. It's why there are not many pieces written in Locrian mode. And most of the times are kind of cheating because it's really hard. Because your tonic chord, the, the chord that starts from B, is a diminished chord and doesn't have enough stability to, to, you know, base a piece on it. And by the way, we're listening to the organ here, also known as the Hammond, but Hammond is actually a brand of organ, but is so well known that uh, people interchangeably kind of use it as a name for the actual instrument. It's a keyboard instrument. I was really looking for an excuse to use the organ in the soundtrack and uh, the 70s style of psychedelic and prog rock music that we were doing really kind of called for it and it was a great uh, chance to, to use a lot of organ. It's, it's, not, it's, it's never like uh, in a lead position, it's always like doing uh, fills and uh, adding up the harmony in the background. but. Uh, it's a sound that I really like. I really like this part of the song, it's really so dirty. Again, a very typical example of how I love to essentially abuse the electric guitar, just riding on the whammy bar. Classic Risk of Rain lead again. And now a new instrument is going to join, which is doing this kind of fast passages in the, in the background. This is a VST called The Legend, and it's an emulation of a mini Moog. And essentially, this is kind of the new lead player in the Risk of Rain 2 soundtrack. I really love the sound that it produces and I use it a lot 
for leads and for pads. Pay attention to these drum fills here. That's coming right now. One, two, three, four, five, one. The quintuplet again. And the concept of solos piling up, solo above a solo above a solo. And then suddenly the drummer just stops. The rest of the band kind of keeps going. I really liked a comment on YouTube by someone who said it's like the player has fallen off the stairs or something. And the picture I was going for here is that there's so, so much intensity that the players are kind of reaching a peak and at some point they're like, oh, fuck it, I'm not playing anymore. Yet another piece written in 7-8 or 7-4, whatever. But if you notice here, something weird that's uh, going on is that the snare is actually not following the 7 uh, meter. I'll count it when we uh, go into the main beat with the drums. Again, this synth is the CS80. It has such a particular sound, very... It's almost like a person is singing. And the Mellotron pad from Risk of Rain 1. So let's see the snare. Let's count between the snares, right? One, two, three, four. 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 One. So the snare is going as if the, the beat is on 4-4, four, four, but the rest of the uh, music is 7-4. Uh, now it's coming back. Oh, and by the way, we're listening to the gamelan here, this uh, metallic percussive sound. In the background, which is actually playing the motive, the Risk of Rain motive in some variations. This is another new sound that is introduced in this soundtrack, not existing in the previous one. And uh, when I was creating the, the sort of sonic palette of the, of the game. I was looking for sounds that will feel organic. I'm not sure if it's the perfect word to describe it, but something that it feels tangible and... Uh, again, it's not, it's not a proper nomenclature, but non-quantized. Something that feels that is kind of playing very naturalistically. I really like this, uh, this part, this weird um, harmony. I wanted just to have a little sort of bridge that feels very alien, almost jazzy. So there's a solo coming up with the legend, that uh, mini Moog synth that I was talking about. A lot of people were taken aback by how abruptly the solo comes in, but it, to be perfectly honest, it's one of my favorite moments in the entire soundtrack. In the background of the solo, you can hear a pad that's going... A lot of these pulsing sounds are actually just straight-up pads that I'm do in putting a tremolo plug in. 
on top of them and creating this pulse. It's a very handy way to, to create motion out of something static. I had a lot of fun playing with uh, that synthesizer here because it, it can get very, very expressive. This is a moment that uh, didn't exist in, during the early axis, and when I was retouching the tracks, the drummer followed up with the uh, keyboard playing. A little bit of guitar here on the background, doing arpeggios. I'm really happy with these chords here they have this very otherworldly sound. It's almost like chords that would otherwise be used in a thriller with like strings and stuff and create this kind of uh, frightening atmosphere. But here they're almost like serene, but also just ambiguous and uh, alien. The gamelan here. Oh, and completely forgot to mention that the previous track was this drometer. And now we're going to go into the doldrums, which is definitely one of my favorite tracks from the entire soundtrack. And one of the most fun to, to write and perform. Another case of the CS80 here, doing those um, octave um, Portamento pads. Portamento is when uh, a, a sound glides into a new pitch. If you remember this track from the early access version, it actually began with a very low uh, synth doing the opening arpeggio. This. Oh, and by the way, I should say that this um, sequence here is copied and used in the opening track in Through a Cloud Darkly. It's not exactly the same because there it's much slower and it's not uh, on 7-8, but uh, it's the same material. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that it, this track originally didn't have this um, rounded and soft synth that now plays the, the, the main riff, the main lick. And this is a synth that I came up to like midway through the writing the soundtrack. And this is something that is very important about my process with these soundtracks, which is that I'm, I never consider a track done until I have the big picture and I have essentially the entire thing done. Which is to say that oftentimes I come up with new sounds, the palette is expanded, I come up with new ideas motivically, melodically, harmonically, what have you, and I'm always very happy to go back and reverse engineer and splice the old tracks, even if they are essentially complete and add these new elements to them. 
because, because then, it feels instead of having like separate the, pieces, the, you suddenly start to have a cohesive uh, piece of uh, art. You know that it's one thing from start to finish. And I love this concept. This is something that I'm. It, it interests me a lot when writing, especially when writing a soundtrack, but. A a anything you're doing that is to be presented as one thing, as an album, I think needs to have this unity. The risk of rain motive going upwards here on the CS80. I really loved uh, writing this drum part for this piece. And of course, the Risk of Rain lead synth had to make an appearance. If you paid attention to this last phrase, it's a very typical phrase of mine. If you listen to the solos, you will hear me doing this phrase that starts from the fifth, goes down the scale, ends on the two, and then pitch bends into one, or is implied that it's pitch bending into one. And once again, the guitar is taking the lead for the solo, but above it there's another synth doing its own thing. And the drummer is kind of doing his own solo on the background. One of my favorite, absolutely favorite moments is when the guitar feedback goes into the major third of the piece and creates this tension as if like the, suddenly the piece is in a major scale. I really love that moment, which is completely by accident and I made sure I kept that recording in all iterations of this uh, solo. And now we're listening to the piece written for the Void Fields. We wanted to have a very dark, very ambient piece. And uh, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I think it's one of the darkest pieces I've ever written. It was actually kind of depressing working on it after a while, just because I had to listen to this bleakness over and over. There's actually a story behind how this piece got composed, or actually how it got fleshed out, because I had a lot of it, but it, it just wouldn't tie up together. I couldn't figure out what it needed to become an actual thing instead of just like kind of random ambience. And this ties together with what I was talking about before about the tools and how they can be inspiring. And at the time, there was a major update in Cubase, which is the sequencer I'm working on. And uh, with the update, they introduced a new delay unit, a new delay plugin which offered a ton of interesting functionality, especially in how you could manipulate every repetition of the delay by using like distortion and panning, uh, bit crushing and pitch shifting and a bunch of other stuff. But the point is I had a new tool and I was kind of eager to test it and I used it on the electric piano and from a very bland line that was basically nothing, just an atmospheric flourish, it became this kind of weird thing that plays now on top of the ambience. And it was exactly what the piece needed. And of course, we're approaching the fulcrum point of the track, which is none other than the voiceover. And they 
feature here is vile and base. I would see asphyxiation. For those of you not familiar with the gentleman doing the voiceover, that is Werner Herzog. He's a Bavarian uh, filmmaker, makes both fiction films and documentaries. This excerpt here is actually taken from a documentary made by Les Blanc. And uh, he was uh, following Werner Herzog during the filming of his movie Fitzcarraldo, which was used in the Amazon jungle. It was a very a notoriously difficult shoot in which, among other things that they had to suffer, they needed to carry a boat up a hill because it was part of the film's narrative. And to do that, they actually dragged an entire boat up a hill using only basic uh, pulleys and ropes. Anyway, it's a fascinating film that I strongly suggest you, you watch Fitzcarraldo and also the documentary about it, which is called uh, Burden of Dreams. And this is a uh, you know, talking head moment during the documentary in which Herzog talks about nature. I'm particularly proud of this piece for many a reason, but among them, at the very top of the list is this piece's title. You may have noticed that I avoid using generic titles. I never call pieces like Main Theme or Boss Fight One or uh, Mythrix or Void Fields just because a piece happens to play under a particular level. I try to think about them a lot and I try to have them fit thematically between each other so that they're part of a whole. And there are many titles in this soundtrack that I'm really happy with. But in this particular case, I have to say that it's one of my finest moments as a composer, as a human being, really. Because this is hands down the best title I've ever given to any piece of mine. And to be honest, it's probably the best title ever used in any piece of music in the entire world. And the title is... A glacier eventually farts. And don't you listen to the song of life. That's right, motherfucker. It's not my title at all. It's a Werner Herzog but title. I love it against my better That's judgment. why it f***ing rules. So now we're listening to Nocturnal Emission, another one of those great titles of mine. Google it. This track is a bit weird because it features two basses, and I don't mean two instruments playing the same bass line, I actually mean two basses doing different bass lines, and one of them is actually an acoustic bass, which is a first and last for Risk of Rain. The pad in the beginning, the ambience, is actually my voice going through various effects and stuff. This kind of whistly sound that we're still hearing in the background. Another first is the use of flutes here. This breathy sound that comes in once in a while. This track was also born out of a very early demo in which the demo consisted of literally an electric piano doing an arpeggio, the thing that we hear in the beginning of the track. It's also playing in the background here, but in the beginning you can sort of, you know, uh, hear it in detail. 
which is actually uh, a bitonal harmony. And what I mean by that is that it utilizes two different chords from different uh, scales, from different tonalities, kind of clashing against each other. So it goes up from A minor and then follows into F minor and then comes down to A minor again. Again, using the legend here, the Mini Moog emulator plugin to, to do the solo. This is a really weird solo because the chords are kind of going on into weird directions. This pulsating synth is again made using the Eurorack, the pop 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 pop. And if you notice, the end of the solo was the Risk of Rain motive. Here's, here's that uh, electric piano I was talking about. A minor, F minor, A minor, F minor. The gamelan here in reverse. I really like uh, exploiting this organic sound that I was talking about before, which is the reason I use them and kind of wanted to use them in a way that feels like I'm throwing stuff at them and they're kind of reacting. So it's kind of it has this feeling of like, I'm throwing the mallets on the gamelan and they kind of bounce. It has this kind of cling -ling -ling sound to it. We've just heard this breathy flute a recorder actually. It's an old recorder I've had for many, many years lying around. My parents must have picked it up from some uh, trip or something. It's not like a professional grade uh, instrument. It's just been around. Okay, so the next piece is the Dehydration of Risk of Rain 2. This piece used to be called the Dehydration of Risk of Rain 2's main theme by its composer, Chris Christodoulou, which was kind of a play on these super long book titles at the turn of the century, well, the previous century. Uh, or if you can remember the movie, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, that was kind of the idea. I had to uh, shorten it because uh, using my name in the title of a piece might eventually cause confusion with uh, distribution services. Some platforms don't like that and they have kind of strict guidelines as to what can go in a title and what can't. So I decided to just uh, save myself the trouble and scrap it. So there's a small melody played on the CS80 in the background of the next part, but I'm gonna try sing it over this one. Check it out. So this is a quote, a direct quote from another soundtrack that I really, really love. It's from a film called The Ghost Writer. Not Rider, Ghost Writer. Uh, it's not a particularly great movie or anything, but it has a, a very nice soundtrack. It's composed by Alexandre Desplat. And if you take a listen to the main theme of it, uh, you'll see that it's uh, this exact melody. This weird reverse sound is made using my Eurorack. And uh, after a point when I was designing it, I thought it, it reminded me of the, the Joker's laugh at the end of Batman. 
I'm talking about the 1889 Batman by Tim Burton. If you have seen the movie at the end, like Joker falls down from a very high church and he has a little, I don't know, voice uh, thingy in his pocket which is doing this kind of laugh like <laughs> I don't know, this sound just reminded me of that. So speaking about the title of this song, as it implies, this is kind of a redux or a light version of the main theme. But this is a nice opportunity to realize how the music is written and how much information it is in there. Because in reality, this is pretty much the exact same track and I'm just taking out, I'm muting tracks. Which means that this, all this thing, which is a song of its own, a piece of music of, of its own, has a bunch of other things added to it to create like the final proper piece. Not to say that this is a hundred percent, I've just muted a couple of tracks and this came out. No, I've made edits, I've added parts or tweaked parts to fit better. But this is kind of the idea which is to say that Risk of Rain, both one and two, they are very dense compositions. There's a lot of stuff going on. Essentially, the idea behind this is that it kind of mimics what's going on in the game, where you're, you know, you're, you're put in this world and suddenly you're uh, attacked from everywhere by enemies. Again, the little melody that I was talking about that goes from the fifth -da 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 -da, lands on the second and the second pitch bends down to one. If you pay attention, you will hear it a lot in my solos. And now we're going into Parjanya, which is an Indian god of rain. This is really one of my favorite tracks. One of the first ones I did, uh, one of the few early demos that, that then became this piece. The CS80 again is uh, very prominent here. I'm also using a kind of a spectral synthesizer called Iris from Isotope, in which you can drop samples and then you can pick and choose over time which frequencies of those samples will be played back and how, like the speed, the, the, the motion, if it's going to be reverse forward, stuff like that. And it can create weird effects. This is, this is used to make the pad in the background. This growly sound here, this one is made using the Eurorack again and it's side-chained using the drums. If you're not familiar with side-chaining, let me go through the process really fast. Essentially, you're putting a plug-in on one track and you're feeding it with the sound of a different track. And depending on what plug-in you're using, it will react and affect the track that it's on. Small parenthesis, listen to the quintuplets. One, two, three. Back to the side chaining. Um, the most common use of it is having a compressor on one track and triggering it with a different track, usually the drums or something. And what happens is that when the compressor is triggered, it uh, attenuates the signal. So you might use it on a pad or a voice or whatever. And for example, when your kick drum comes in, the, your pad will be attenuated leaving this kind of gap in the sound. And I'm using this technique here. I really love the atmosphere of this track. And um, 
I was very happy that we got to use it. Um, it's one of those weird tracks. When we started talking with Hopu, the, the early demos were really um, daring, I should say. What with the by tonality experiment or this really weird thing, uh, or, or sending him just a drum loop. Um, because I wanted to, to see how much I can uh, push it, you know, and see how uh, will, how crazy will they allow me to get? And uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, they have always been like, we don't mind, you know, the, whatever you want to do. Okay, now we're listening to Hydrophobia. I think this was one of the first heavy metal tracks that I wrote for the game. I think the boss fight was thermodynamic equilibrium and then it was this. And at that point I had figured out that, you know, we're using the acoustic, acoustic drums, we're not doing a fully electronic thing, there's a lot of guitars and stuff, so I said, okay, let's, let's go full metal. Of course, there's like electronic bass. I was looking for something to make the track a little bit more interesting and not feel like a repetition, so I added this da 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 da. And then I took it a bit further by actually chopping stuff out to make it feel, you know, more mechanical. By the way, this part is essentially a copy-paste from uh, Moisture Deficit's middle part. I've even took, took some of the guitar synths and stuff, and then I took the guitars of the outro and added them here. If you listen like on the sides, very, really low. And I was truly disappointed because when I did this, I thought people would freak out. It would be like, yeah, Risk of Rain 1, baby, it's back. And practically no one got it. Speaking of Risk of Rain 1, this uh, is called Antarctic Oscillation, and the title is a direct reference to the track Arctic Oscillation from Risk of Rain 1. And of course this uh, kind of uh, synthy sample here is taken straight from that track and manipulated into this new one. Again, it's a track written in 7-4. And the tremolo on the guitar, the whammy bar, is uh, going on full steam. This part here, actually, is kind of uh, an imitation of the first verse, let's call it a verse, of Dewpoint. Again, so naive, I thought people would get that and leave comments about it, this reminds me of Dewpoint and stuff. No one ever did get it. You guys need to study more. The chip tuny sound and the xylophone sound from uh, Risk of Rain 1 make an appearance. By the way, I should say this is um, Antarctic Oscillation because we did a remake of Sky Meadow. So I wanted to, since we were doing like a straight remake of an existing level from the first game, I wanted to do a callback to the music. So this is a callback to the boss track, which was Arctic Oscillation at that point. And by the way, using again quintuplets to create this kind of um, weird sensation of instability. One, two, three. 
five, two, two, three, four, five, da, 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 da. one, and two, three, four, or five. It's the kick drum and it's the ride cymbal that are doing the, the quintuplets. This guitar solo and the keyboard solo were swapped in the original version and then I pull it back because it felt like the, the guitar, the, the keyboard solo is a bit more meaty, has more stuff to do and uh, so I wanted to have it second as a kind of a more uh, tension release thing. And for this part I'm kind of bringing the chords from Arctic Oscillation right here and doing a new thing. One of the things that a lot of people asked uh, during the production of the game, they wanted to, to see the old tracks brought into the game. But that, that's, that's something that I didn't find interesting, to do covers of my own music. So I thought, okay, I'll bring them in, but my own way. I'll make something new out of it. And this is one of these attempts. I love how crazy the solo gets. It's just, it's just nuts. And some crazy tapping on the guitar here. I really wanted to have this like double uh, kick uh, rhythm on the drums and just. It used to be twice as long, but. Because it was literally a copy-paste with some minor adjustments, I felt like, why, why should I have the same thing twice? It's just an appetizer, you know? Don't need to be stuffed with it. And then again, this part plays three times, which is why. It could be two. Speaking of this, um, adjustments of form and uh, parts and all that stuff. This has been really troubling for me in the soundtrack because it was really hard to, to handle uh, the form of the pieces because a lot of them have a lot of different stuff, different parts going on and it was hard to decide, okay, do I need to play this again or is it enough? Is it coming back earlier? Is it going to come later? I don't know, I, I struggle a lot with it. I know that in games you can afford a lot of repetition. I mean, essentially, like the first 20 years of gaming is just like one and a half minute loops that just play on and on and on and on. But because of the style of these compositions, I really wanted to avoid like useless repetition. So I really struggled with what will come at which point and how many times and all that stuff. Again, the quintuplet on the kick drum. It sounds like it's in the, in the beat when it's on its own. But listen to the tambourine here, for example. One, two, three, four, five, one, two. And the kick drum follows that. I don't know why this fascination with quintuplets. It was something that stuck to me from early on when I was thinking about the soundtrack and I thought one of the elements, one of the motives that I want to use is just the quintuplet and, it, and I just went for it. I guess it was also kind, kind of in vogue with modern music at this time, especially like, you know, progressive and composed music. I'm not talking about like pop songs and stuff. Okay, and here's the other track from uh, Sky Meadow. And again, calling back to the original track, Sanchon de Tom, I took the electric piano um, riff from it and mangled it to create this bed 
for this track. Other stuff brought from the original piece is uh, part of the drum loop of it that is layered on top of this drum loop, which is made actually using an emulation of the Lin drum. And if you don't know, the Lin drum is a, synth a, a drum synthesizer, a drum machine uh, of the late 70s and the 80s that was favored by several artists, including Prince. And this is why I brought it in. And if you pay close attention to this particular piece, because I'm using the drum machine and because I wanted to stay very true in form, there's actually zero fills. There's literally one drum loop that plays throughout the track and no acoustic drums. Na, da, da, da. Again, the risk of rain motive makes its appearance on the organ and on the main melody. Now, I really love this guitar, how it turned out, this clean electric guitar. I'm using a touch of an envelope uh, stomp box. Uh, it's, used, it's called envelope, but in reality, what it does is it listens to the signal and it applies a little bit of a filter to it. So depending on how loud or soft you play, it has this kind of wah effect that opens up or closes along with the, with the volume. And that's where the envelope part comes in. Again, the risk of rain melody. being answered by the Risk of Rain melody. The current drum loop playing is literally the, the drums from Chanson de Tom, but uh, with a filter on them. By the way, this theme, this little riff that does the um, on the background. Is actually a melody that's been stuck in my head for like 25 years or so. And without going back and looking at it, it is how I thought it was. And it's a melody from the video game Test Drive 2, a very old racing video game. And I literally thought that this is how the melody goes, like the riff. And I went back to listen to it after I had recorded the piece. And it's, it's not like it's nothing like that, but it's really like very fast. Uh, it has different kind of uh, inflections, so to speak. It's weird how memory plays these tricks. Like I thought it was the exact thing and I was quoting it and then it was something quite different. And I'm sure that you're all annoyed I'm talking over the solo. This solo took me, if this piece took about like two weeks overall to produce, the solo took 13 days. Because I wanted to, to be perfect, like every note I needed it to be perfect. And obviously here, the, the big reference to Purple Rain. Oh, I didn't mention that this track is called The Rain, formerly known as Purple, because it's a, kind of a homage to Prince, which for a period uh, of his career, he was known as the artist formerly known as Prince essentially because he had changed his name into a weird symbol to get out of a contract with his uh, label. And 
this part of the solo and, and uh, up to the end was a later addition after the early access track that came out. In fact, I should say that because this kind of fades out now into the outro, but the reality is that the, the solo goes on a little bit further that you can actually listen here. But if you uh, get the Risk of Rain 2 Engineer in Edition 2, which has the stems, it actually includes all the solo all the way up, up to the point that it just stops, because I knew that I'm, I was fading out. And this track that comes in here is all, again kind of a reference to uh, Purple Rain, because the song ends with this kind of piano and the uh, uh, string quartet doing some weird chords. This is an interesting part of the piece because uh, for a very long time I thought that the piece would be, I don't know, five minutes or something, and then this part would be a 12 minute uh, love letter to Prince uh, and would go on and would play with the organ and have like a full build up and be another entirely new piece or something. At some point I had split them in two. Eventually became this like this somber uh, thing that to me kind of represents his ascension. As simple as it sounds, it took me a shitload of takes and variations to actually get here. What with the sounds, the exact tempo, the like every little drum hit on the cymbals, I, I fine tuned that to to I don't know my wit's end essentially. But it turned out nicely, I think. Okay, so now we're going into the raindrop that fell to the sky. This is a very special piece for me. When I was writing this one, I was so extremely tired by working on the game. And we were basically halfway through and I was already like, I don't know if I can pull this off until the end. Essentially, everybody was like, we just want coalescence too, we don't care about anything else. And I was like, I'm trying to do something here. I'm trying really hard to do something. And everybody just cares for one thing, just the same old, same old. And that was starting to get to my head. I started like being a bit aggressive about it to people, that because it's, it's okay to and I feel, I understand that everybody wants it because they love the track and I'm honored and amazed and appreciative of that fact. But at some point I was like, I need to move on as a composer and my, it's not my intention to just, you know, do one thing. And this piece kind of represents this. This uh, has been an outlet of this frustration to, to some degree. By the way, it's also written in five. And uh, there's a little bit of a dispute going on. Is this in 5-8? Is it in 5-4? Is it in 10? One, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five. You can count it however you like. Technically, in the sequencer, is written as 5-8. And it also uh, becomes more strictly 5-8, so to speak, in the, in the later part, in the fast part. 
but here you can easily call it 5-4. To me it's a 5-4 at least. Also this is the introduction of um, the small rototoms on the, on the drum kit. I hadn't used them until now and they came in with this track because I wanted to have this like this kind of feels. This track uses the technique called pedal, which means that the chords above it change, but the bass note remains the same. It's on the tonic all the time. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Here it's clearly five, eight. I'm really happy with this chord progression. Re really, really happy with it. How weird it is and uh, kind of unexpected. Well, the, the, the piece is kind of static. And then we have, you have this really weird part. And I'm super happy about the drums here especially like the nuance on the hi-hat. It's hard for me to, to talk over this track because I just enjoy listening to it. Again, this is the legend that is playing, the Mini Moog emulation thing, which I've used so much. I loved it so much. Uh, some, somebody on Twitter, some friend from Twitter uh, recommended to me this synth because uh, they saw I was using the Arturia suite and um, they also have a Mini Moog, the Mini V, I think they call it. And he said, hey, check out the legend. It's kind of a better emulation of uh, the Mini Moog. And, I don't want to say it's better, but it's really good. It, better is a very subjective term because it, speaking of it as a strict emulation of the Mini Moog, it's not better. But it's a better synth overall. Because it has additional like waveforms that you can use and, and maybe slightly more, more beefy sound to it, I guess. I'm not sure. So we've gone into the B part of the piece in which the, the chords will change a little bit. Listen to the melody here. Five going into two, gliding into one. Risk of rain motive here. I really like building the anticipation for something and going into the, from the tonic, falling into the four, the minor four. It's just a simple thing, it's a really simple uh, chord change, obviously. But it, it just felt to me like, okay, now the track has opened up a little bit because we were pretty much straight on the tonic for the whole time. And then I'm bringing this four on the first part of the beat of the, of the bar and it, this kind of indicates this, this new thing that's going on now. Recording this part has been one of the most, I don't want to say joyful, but spiritual, I think, experiences I've had recording something. Because I had this on a loop and I was playing and playing and kind of soloing and the, the lead sound 
It was very expressive and after a lot of improvisation I kind of figured out all the little pieces, all the lines and of the solo and I was like, ah, this, this is so nice. It just relaxed my soul, essentially. This carries a lot of influence from like Greek traditional music, like playing on the clarinet, people or on the fiddle. It's kind of very free, very fluid sort of lines or even vocal improvisations that we do like with, with, without lyrics and speaking of vocal this is the second time in the soundtrack that I'm using my voice the first time I think it was during a nocturnal emission was it where I created a, a pad or something with it but this is literally a choir so I've I've sang four parts and I copied them. I, if you listen to the engineer edition, you will see that it's like very non-vocally. It's like really weird. Uh, I've pitch bended. I've uh, uh, did vocoder passes on it. It's like really electronic y non non-vocal at all. But it's still, I consider it my first use of a choir in Risk of Rain 2. Because the human voice is so unique an instrument and this piece I really wanted it to become really a spiritual experience just like I felt it recording it and to transmit that I thought I have to use a voice because none of the none of the synthesizers not even like the orchestral instruments or whatever can really express this feeling of spirituality Again, the Risk of Rain motive is everywhere in the soundtrack. Sometimes I get comments about uh, this, like uh, some, someone will say, yeah, 531, I can hear the motive there. And I'm like, yeah, it's everywhere. Not to sound like ironic or anything, I love it when I get those comments. It's just that if you really go looking for it, you will see that it's like literally everywhere. And in this section, I'm just stripping down like the, the chords from the bridges of the piece and just, you know, laying them down bare, like only the guitars and stuff. So now we're going into the final boss fight. It's called, you're gonna need a bigger ukulele. Ukulele, ukulele, we call it ukulele in Greece, but I'm not sure how the pronunciation is on uh, in English. Obviously we're going for a fat, heavy metal sound, as heard for the first time in the original Doom 2016. That's an abrupt transition there. I wish it was a little bit better, but it's too late to go back now. Or is it? And this is the theme from uh, Double Fucking Rainbow. This is a piece that I always wanted to, to bring back and explore further and see if I can, you know, kind of revisit it. Because I really loved how black it was, how, you know, like gloomy. And again, this kind of mirrors uh, Double Fucking Rainbow with, with the fast part and the chippy, chip tuny sounds. And here we go into uh, this uh, section which I took a loop from Precipitation, which is the boss fight that played uh, during the Providence fight in Risk of Rain 1. And kind of tweaked it into this uh, part with like the weird guitars as a callback because 
you're fighting Mithrix, which is Providence's brother. An interesting thing here is that this piece is written in 7-2, like the, the main parts are in 7-2, like a slow 7. And when I brought in this um, loop from precipitation, I didn't actually change the meter in, in the sequencer, and I just stretched the sample so that this 4-4 four, four, uh, drum loop fitted into this 7-2. Uh, section length. So essentially I'm creating this kind of uh, metric modulation here by not applying you know any weird mathematics or anything but, but literally just stretching one part into the space that uh, would normally fit another. I really wanted this, this piece to be like black metal, just pure black metal. So in comes the Risk of Rain synth on, to do its own pass. And there's this new uh, riff on the guitars. Which was previously heard on the cheap tuning stuff. Again, a drum loop from uh, precipitation here. Here's the tip tuning thing again. Okay, so now we're going to go into Conletti di Poderosa. And this is my fourth attempt to squeeze all the information that I have to share about this one within the length of the track. I will surely fail once again. So I will probably this time allow myself to go into the next track and just keep talking about it. So, is this Coalescence 2? If you ask me, no, it is not. It is a piece that is not a sequel, is not a remake, it's not a remix, but it is a satellite of coalescence. And I'm using the word satellite very specifically because, of course, it's a piece that plays on the moon. But what I mean by that is that you need to get the full potential of the track, to, to get the track and what it's trying to do, you need to have the gravitational pull that is coalescence. To stay in the orbit, essentially, of what this is going on here. So let's talk a little bit about the intro. The piano is a romantic reharmonization of the chorus from Coalescence. A lot of people have said, this reminds me of Chopin Prelude. Yes, obviously, especially the first two chords are exactly the same. Uh, but it was never my intention to cover a specific Prelude by Chopin. And my intention was to, to, to do Coalescence in a romantic style of Chopin, and of the Romantic era. And then we have the electric piano that plays the melody from Coalescence and the electric guitar leading into this uh, 
kind of tension moment with a timpani. But the melody that will come here is actually the melody from the riff of Monsoon. This is taken from Monsoon verbatim. I don't think a lot of people have noticed that, how this is kind of a blend of Coalescence and Monsoon, because the, the chords are obviously from Coalescence. Anyway, this is my way of bringing a closure, bringing everything together back from the point where we started, but also to the point where we ended, because we're about to fight Mithrix, who's the brother of Providence and all that. So this is kind of how I try to convey this musically. So I struggle a lot with this piece. I struggle with it for an entire year during the early access period. While I was writing all the other pieces, I was thinking, how, how can we wrap this up? And I want, I'm not talking about Coalescence 2 or anything like that. My, uh, my idea was, okay, what are, what are we going to do for the final level? Because I knew how important the final level of the first game was to people and the piece that played there in particular. And I was thinking, can we do something that will, you know, match this emotional payback or, or even take it a step further to some degree? And I just kept thinking about it and didn't know how to do it. I, I tried so many versions of this track. Eventually, when I came up with this idea that we will have this very, very slow intro and then burst into this powerful uh, emotional moment, I thought, okay, this is probably how is the only way to do it, at least the way I, I can do it. And I've struggled a lot of it. I, I had a lot of changes uh, there, like many different solos. But in the end, I don't know, I'm happy with it. I feel, I feel really proud of how it uh, turned out. And the main like, uh, test, main criterion for it was that it had an emotional impact on myself before anyone else. And then I was happy to see that a lot of people felt that emotional impact as well. And I want to spend just a little bit talking about the title. Con Letitud Poderosa is uh, taken from a text by Jorge Luis Borges. It's a short story called En, Irmo en Inmortal. Uh, I, was, uh, I started reading Borges about three years ago. I started actually like doing a deep dive and reading a lot of his uh, texts. Uh, before that, I only knew him like very vaguely. I've sporadically read uh, a couple of short stories. But I came upon this text and reading this paragraph, which is quoted on the album and uh, uh, in Bandcamp. If you go back to Bandcamp and, and uh, check out the album, you, you will find the full quote. It's also in the description of the YouTube video for the piece. But. Reading this quote was really a, a moment that I was struck in awe. I was really like, wow, this is such a beautiful piece of writing. And at that moment, I didn't even uh, think this will make a good title or anything. I was like, oh, this is so beautiful. And I, and I marked it. I uh, did a little thing on the page there to, to remember it because I do that on the books I read. I curve the pages so I can then go back and see, or underline stuff. And at some point I was thinking about it and I was like, you know what, this, this uh, text ends with, it rained with powerful slowness. And because I was using thematically this concept of water and rain and weather and all that stuff, I, thought, I, could, I said, that's a, that's a nice thing to, to quote. And eventually when I listened to the track and how it had turned out, I thought, I, there is none better title than this for it, with powerful slowness. It describes perfectly what's going on. 
even my own emotional state, writing it, and the things that I wanted to convey with it. And I think that wraps up the story of Con Lentitude Poderosa. At least, as it will be recorded in this commentary, because there's a lot of stuff that I can say about it, like references in it. There's a reference to Queen's A Winter's Tale in the solo that we couldn't listen to now because I was talking over it. Uh, I don't know, the, there's so much to, to say. Anyway, now we're into Petricor V or Petricor V, however you want to call it. Both are accurate for different reasons. The title Petricor comes from a YouTube comment. If you are the person who left that comment seven years ago, when I released Risk of Rain 1 and left a comment and said, you should use the title Petricor. I want you to know if you're listening to this that I had bookmarked that comment. I've lost it at some point, like changing browsers or whatever, losing my bookmarks. But I've never forgotten about it. I've had a note of it because I really love the title. And instantly when I saw that comment, I took a note and I said, I'm going to use that in Risk of Rain 2 if we, if we ever make it. And then after a while, I saw that, yes, we're going to make it. So I kind of refreshed my memory about it, kept kept a mental note. In the meantime, Disaster Piece came out with the soundtrack for Hyper Light Drifter and it had a track called Petricor in it. And I was like, oh, bummer, man. That, that's now they're going to say that I copied from that, which, of course, nobody said that. Because who cares? But uh, I still wanted to have a spin on the title, so it's not exactly the same as the one from Disaster Piece. So I added the V. And here's where the V comes from. When we started talking with Hopu about the game, during our very first discussion, talking about like musical influences that might go into the game, we both at, almost at the same time said Blade Runner. And because Vangelis had written the score for Blade Runner, I thought when they asked me to, to do a piece that is for a secret level that will be very like open and uh, ambient and stuff, I, I discussed this with Duncan, I think, and immediately went on and written this piece in like the next like 30 minutes or something. This is a very simple piece in, in conception. It's like literally like made from three layers or something, like a, a synth that is playing the main ambience, one that's playing the melody, and another one that is coming in and out at some points. Now in its, in its final stage, it has like a couple of more layers added to it. But this was a piece that when I wrote, I was thinking only of one thing. I was thinking Vangelis. I want to do something as an homage to Vangelis. So again, this piece has the legend does the, the, the bulk of the piece, like the main ambience and stuff, is from, coming from the legend, this VST, and then the melody comes from the CS80, but more importantly, it's that the style is a Vangelis-like piece, especially considering some of his more open ambient, ambient ones. And the most important thing about this one is that it's in a major key. And I was so excited to get to write something in a major key. I was so happy about it. I feel so calm listening to this piece. So that's where the V comes from. The V is like a tag that says, this is for Vangelis. But a happy coincidence and a lot of stuff in art are happy coincidences. The Roman numeral V is five. And as I said, Five is kind of a key concept in this entire soundtrack. So five is also a valid way to interpret this V in Petricor V or Petricor V. Funny thing about this piece is uh, a lot of people from the community started uh, because this reminds people 
of how we name planets. If you think of, I don't know, Star Trek maybe or whatever sci-fi, very, it's very often that planets are called something and a number. And by the way, I don't know if people know this, but this is the case that the first name is the name of the sun of the solar system and the number is the number of the planet orbiting that sun. So, for example, Earth is Sol 3 in our solar system. So Petricor 5 means the fifth planet from the sun Petricor. But yeah, people started calling the planet Petricor 5. The planet never had a name and at some point uh, Duncan sent me a message and said Hey man, how did you come up with that title? And I essentially told him the story I've just told you. And he said, yeah, well, you know, people are kind of calling this planet Petricor 5 and I've never given it a proper name. I've, I've always called it the planet. I was thinking that maybe we can adopt that. And I was like, yeah, okay, that's cool. That's awesome. So you guys did this. Thank you. By the way, if you pay attention to the melody coming next in the CS80, the, the bright, shiny one, not the hollow. This one, this, follow this line if you can. It's the Risk of Rain motive. You can listen to it uh, more clearly uh, in, in the next section where I kind of repeat it as a coda. And I'll uh, uh, go through the chords with you so we can kind of finalize it together. So this is the tonic, the one of the piece. This was over the six. That was over the two, both minor chords. Now we're landing on five. And back to one. And now we're going into lacrimosum, which means the tearful one. Not he or she, it, the tearful thing. Uh, this is literally a redux version of Con Letitude Poderosa. I think the only thing I touched was the filter on the lead synth so that it's a bit more brighter and feels more like a proper melody. Otherwise, everything that you hear was just playing during Con Letitude Poderosa and I muted out some of the tracks and stuff. And I think this wraps things up. It's been almost two hours. I could easily talk about it for two more hours. So please leave comments, ask me about things. I'll try to uh, reply to as much as possible. Whatever you want to know about the process, about uh, the album, about the development, whatever. An idea I had is select a few tracks, like two or three tracks, and uh, do a specific walkthrough uh, having the sessions open and taking you channel by channel, note by note, effect by effect, etc. So if you have any preferences, please leave them below. By the way, the Risk of Rain 2 Engineer Edition 2 is available right now. It's the album exported in stamps. There's a link in the description. You can get it and uh, really dig deep into the tracks. And there's also a link to the various available platforms Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp. If you can listen 
on any of those platforms or buy the album on Bandcamp, it means a lot. It helps a lot and allows me to keep writing music. So if this has been interesting and you want to hear more, that's the best way to support me. I want to thank you for listening. I hope this has been informative and enjoyable. And I'll see you soon with more Risk of Rain stuff. Farewell.